All right, good morning. It is uh, yeah, January 11th, and it's cold in Newport, Rhode Island. Big news. Uh, it's winter here. It's full on, but um, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, wherever you sit, but I think we're all currently on the East Coast, except for Eisler. Uh, you're, you're our lone West Coast standout today, so thanks for getting up early. Um, so, kind of a cool day today. We've got some news. We've got new people joining us. We've got uh, well, I guess maybe we can scroll through. I don't know if everybody can see. We've got Paige Raley checking in from uh, Lauderdale. Dane Wilson, are you in Lauderdale as well? You're in Miami, I'm assuming. Um, in Miami. And uh, Leandro Spina, the uh, leader of all these fearless Olympic athletes. Um, yeah, I'm assuming you're in Miami as well. And uh, I apologize. Other West Coast. Let me check it in from San Diego. Uh, so, uh, yeah, kind of busy time down in Rockland. Things are getting going, but until we get to the cup, let's, um, got some news to share. The U.S. Sailing has let us know that, uh, I guess, uh, as of today, they are make the announcement that they're starting um, a uh, collection of regattas around the country called the U.S. Open Sailing Series, sponsored by the West Marine. So, technically, the West Marine Open, U.S. Open Sailing Series. Um, some Olympic style training events, what might otherwise be known as the OCRs that we can't use. But um, so we've got a couple of three events in Florida um, over January, February, and then the fun looks like it moves to California. So the first one coming up is in Lauderdale, um, which looks to be uh, laser 4.7s, basically the laser classes and radials. And then all the fun high performance classes in Miami and the IQ foils as well. That'll be, I look forward to chatting with you on that one. Leon. Um, and then classes to be determined to California. So anyway, uh, for our viewers, we'll play uh, this quick video here and uh, give a little taste of what's, uh, what it's all about. The US Open Sailing Series is a great platform for Olympic class racing in our country. Um, Olympic sailing is an exciting part of our sport and I think having more events supporting these classes is a great thing for U.S. sailors. All right, there you go. Quick and dirty. So, uh, Paige Raley. Where'd you go? Let's see if we can find here. You, uh, let's see. We'll put you on speaker view, but yeah, Paige, uh, what have you been doing since we last saw you? And this, you get the first event to come up in Lauderdale and, um, uh, how's the training going and what, what's, what's happening in your world? Well, since Australia of last year, obviously COVID hit, uh, I was doing a lot of working out inside of my gym. I, uh, made a gym, I'm sorry, inside of my garage, made a gym there was out on the bike a lot. And then when Florida started opening up, then we were allowed to get back to training on the water. So for the last few months, I've been down in South Florida a lot, working out with the trainers and uh, doing some training out of Lauderdale Yacht Club, which, you know, big thanks to them for allowing us to be there and doing some training up at the Clearwater Community Sailing Center in Clearwater, which big thanks to them as well. Now we're down in Fort Lauderdale and I'm with the ODP. So the development girls, and we've been, we formed a group here and over the last few months where we're pushing each other in the gym, we're pushing each other on the water. And now we are gearing up for our first event in what was it, like nine months or so. So we're pretty excited. So Leandra, how do you, uh, how do you rein in all these, these uh, scattered types into this sort of first official training event, you know, and, and make good use of it? Well, um, like Paige was saying, it's been a challenging year, but with challenges, you always find opportunities. So we got really close or closer working with young talent on opportunities. And we have this vision of integration in between the youth, youth talent and the top players. And having a domestic platform is, is the, um, the best way to move forward, we all believe. And... Uh, like Paige was saying, Florida was the first area that not only because the weather, but we were able to uh, go back on the water. And with a lot of people involved, we created very strict uh, 
COVID safety protocols to take care of each other. And here we are, you know, a lot of people are sailing in Florida, uh, a lot of classes. And now we have this new series of events. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, uh, Paige, I was, I was thinking to you uh, the other day, I mean, uh, you've definitely, one of your many incredible battles you've, you've fought through the, your immune system uh, challenges. And, and does that add a full level of, you know, uh, complexity for you, making sure you stay healthy? Yeah, for sure. So my autoimmune actually attacks my lungs. So COVID and an autoimmune in your lungs is obviously not a good combination. So I, along with my doctors and U.S. Sailing, we just developed a really strict system that I have to stick by. So at times I have to double mask it or, you know, just kind of keep myself a bit away from the crowds. So I have a lot more that I can lose because my body, body probably wouldn't handle it as well as like, let's say a normal functioning body. So we just have to, you know, I have to be really smart about it. I can't get lax, even though let's say we are more open and uh, biz, like back to business, we'll say. Well, you're a tough one, man. So I know if anybody, you'll be, be the one to fight it and be a strong one. So good luck with it. Keep it clean. Uh, so this, this squad you've got training um, with you in the, in the laser class, uh, are, you, are you the natural born leader to them or, or um, who's, uh, who's stepping up into the front there? Out of the young girls or like who's no, stepping up? No, you've got a whole group of good girls there. Yeah, I mean, great group of girls. I am definitely the old one. <laughs> so I, I surpassed the age. I mean, I have been sailing a laser or even sailing uh, Opti's since Opti days, uh, longer than they've been alive, which is definitely an interesting situation for me. Uh, but it's been great. I, you know, I have a lot of years of experience already, so I can help mentor them and, you know, kind of just teach them the things that I've already learned along the road without them having to make the same mistakes and learn the process. Uh, they've also been great because they're young and they're naive and they're extremely enthusiastic, which is a nice mentality to have around because it pushes me. So I think it's like a nice balance between us all. Mm. You remember some of those early world championships, uh, you sort of reflect back and, and recognize some of the naivete of yourself back in the early days? Part, I'm sorry, I cracked up. Uh, so, you know, if you think back to some of your early world championships uh, back your room when you were, you know, preteen, um, do, do you see some of the naivety that you see in some of the girls today that you, you can recognize? Yeah, for sure. Like w what I love when you're young and, you know, you don't know a lot about the sailors that are on the scene already, you just go out there with guns blazing. So you don't care who you're lining up next to. You don't care if that person's in your lane, you're tacking on them, you're doing whatever you, you know, whatever you think is good in the moment, which is nice because they there's just no consequences, you know, in their heads. And I, I really like being around that first mentality. Yeah. Well, um, so this, this first event, um, Leandro, is, I mean, is it, how, how, how important is it in this path to, you know, which, which now seems even somewhat um, not problematic. There's, you know, the, the rumors of, of things not to be. What, what's your thoughts? Well, uh, I think these events and this series of events in America are going to be a game changer for our, for our country. I really do believe that. Um, we have a lot of talent in the country. And now with the domestic platform, um, a lot more people can be part of the pathway and with a more efficient way to start their campaigns. And some people, uh, they can do it without even dreaming about going to Olympics, but they want to be part of an excellent program and get top level coaching and line up against Dane and, and Paige and all our Olympians. Um, so the community is going to grow and, and you can see now even yacht clubs uh, being part of this you know, movement. And, and when you have volunteers that they care and all the stakeholders and is domestic, uh, I think we're going to be way more efficient on getting better. And that's why I think it's, um, it's a game changer for our country. I'm very, very excited. Mm, so there was, uh, there was always a time, and Ed Baird, you probably remember, where the, the Miami OCR was like anybody could show up and 
have these epic fleets and, um, you know, average schmucks like me could go down and play with the types. And so I guess that's, that's a bit of this concept is to reopen the doors again to, to people to come and sail with everyone at the high level. And um, so that, yeah, to grow it from there. And so, Ed, will you uh, dust off the laser then? Will we see you at any of these, these events now that they're open to you? Yeah, I've been having a lot of fun with the laser over the past few years, but uh, we don't have any more in my family, so <laughs> it's uh, it's not uh, it's not for us in the short term. But you're right that uh, you know, I mean, these events are so important. Uh, you know, we need to drag the best talent from the other parts of the world to come here, and so that our people can see you know, what they're up against and what, what the difference in level is, whatever that might be. Uh, you know, that was one of the great opportunities that so many of us had when we did Olympic campaigns in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. You know, we had a lot of people coming here and you really got a feel for how hard you had to work, you know, where you were. It's like Paige says that, you know, the, the, the young people are, are just not sure where they are in the mix. So you just go out there guns blazing, but sometimes you got to line up against somebody that blows you away. And then you go, oh, there's another step that can be taken here. And uh, those are things that you can only find out through competition. So we need to bring those big events back here as, as much as possible. And Leandro, you guys are you're doing a great job trying to make that happen. And, you know, I know it's not easy, uh, but it's a good time right now to do it. Anybody uh, want to jump in here before I keep throwing some questions their way? All right, Gary. I, I, if I could uh, go to Leandro for a second. Leandro, uh, last I checked in, we had not gotten a slot in the games with the 49er class. And we had one person I think was first on deck to get in. And then is, is the rest of the team settled or my recollection is maybe the women's 470 is, is not yet decided who goes. Where, where does that stand? Um, to answer first, the 49ers, uh, USA is first in line for an Olympic spot. And so the squad, we have four teams uh, working together right now as if we are going to Olympics. We're full in full business uh, mode. And we have new teams now coming up from ODP training alongside. So, and we remain hopeful that the, uh, the spot will become available. So we're acting as if we are going to Olympics. They, they can give you more details. Uh, to answer all the 470 women uh, in our Olympic system, Olympic trial system, there's one more event uh, in a few weeks in Portugal is the 470 World Championships. And if that event happens, will be the deciding event of our Olympic trials for the 470 women. Do you think that event is gonna take place, Leandro? Uh, nobody knows. Everybody's working as if it will happen. We're planning accordingly, but you know, the world today is, is complex. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Right. Well, let, let me just say, I, I really applaud, <clears throat> excuse me, the work on this uh, U.S. Open. West Marine sponsoring it is uh, very cool. And I, I like the fact that you've spread it out on dates and you spread it out with geography which at some of these local events will bring more and more young people in the kind that Paige is working with. And, you know, there's an awful lot of stories about young sailors that get inspired to do Olympics when they're uh, 15 or 16 years old and eventually become Olympians, Paige yep. being one of them. And, uh, and so I think it speaks well for our future. So well done here. Thank yeah. you. So, yeah. I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, the, after Paris, the Olympics is going to be in L.A. So looking at the really big picture, you know, how do we create structures that we can maximize that home field advantage um, racing in Long Beach? Yeah, that, that's a very good point, Jonathan, because it's part of our strategy to build a platform on time to mature by right, when the rest of the world they think, okay, we need to go to America. And by then we're gonna have young talent prepared. We have the top players prepared. We have the events and the organizers prepared. We have the whole community ready for it. So we can showcase what we are capable of. And, but it's also about 
performing mentality, you know, performance mentality. They need to come to Long Beach, our competition, and we're going to be ready for them. So the, the openness of it applies to Sandy, uh, the California events as well, I'm assuming. And so, um, you know, maybe we can, you know, like Ed, Miami will drag Steve Hunt into a uh, 470 program and give Stu and Dave uh, some time together out there. And uh, maybe Eisler, what, you know, was this the start of something for you? Did you see? Yeah, I was, I was great on the wire back in the day. Hey, Leandro, what, what is um, in, in the short term, are you, I'm thinking back to, you know, Jonathan's experience with the FDs and Ed and my experience with the Solings where, um, you know, the North American contingent really helped us a lot even before the Europeans came into the mix. Uh, is this uh, present series inclusive with the Canadians and the Mexican teams? Yes. Uh, in fact, today is the first day of an ODP camp for the Skiffs. We have the top players uh, and we also have a Mexican team invited. We are very inclusive. We believe on, you know, open doors uh, to people that are committed to excellence. So the Canadians, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID, uh, the timing is, is wrong, but we are actually having active conversations of moving forward, working together. And, and with South American countries and with New Zealand and with many other teams, so. There's, um, there's some, some talk recently about, you know, the athletes and vaccinations and, and things like that. Um, Leandro, does, uh, does the Olympic sailing team fall under that vaccination early um, access or, or where does that fall? Uh, I don't know that the answer to that question. Maybe Dane or, or Paige knows more. Uh, Meredith Brody is, is the person in our program that really takes care of us with all that uh, situation. So I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right, Dane, you're you're uh, you're queued up, I guess, to go. You're, you're racing in Miami uh, to keep your your program alive and um, keep the path going, hoping for your spot. And uh, so, yeah, can you, can you sort of let us know what's happening on the vaccination front and what what you have to do to stay healthy and keep sailing? Yeah, I mean, no real news for us about the vaccination. Um, but since we last talked, uh, we had the holidays, which, yeah, flew back to California, stayed very distanced, didn't see anybody. And now we're back in Miami getting COVID tests a bunch and um, kind of just creating our little bubble around the U.S. Sailing Center and being able to sail a bunch. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, there's really not much new news. It's kind of... Uh, hurry up and wait, um, keep sailing, pretend like we're going to go. And um, I don't know, it's kind of funny because it, it seems like we've become pretty comfortable with <laughs> not knowing our plans, um, which is pretty weird. But um, yeah, kind of all nothing new here. <laughs> so Dane, how do you stay motivated in a time like this? I mean, are you, are you finding sources within yourself or are you reaching out to your your community and are you guys helping each other to, to stay fired up? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one huge benefit of having our little squad of, of four boats here where no matter, even if I'm really burnt out, someone else isn't, so they're gonna push you a little bit. Um, we've also been super lucky to uh, be working with force um, to be able to train and do that safely. We just, like, we have a time and we go in for just sailors and um, so, we're getting motivated and staying in the gym, doing a lot of hours on the water. Um, so there's, we're just keeping ourselves busy enough that we don't <laughs> kind of go down that rabbit hole. And uh, so Leandro, is the, the hope to kind of shift the whole program over to the West Coast events then once Florida's wrapped up? Yes, um, we hope to extend the, um, the training in Florida a little longer. Uh, obviously, our top players, uh, if, if it's safe, they're going to be uh, tapping into some events in Europe. And by the time they come back, we, ODP and the young generation will be based in California. And, you know, in fact, we're going to take care of the logistics for the people going to Europe. So when they come back, the platform is ready in California. So some, the short version is uh, winters in Florida and summers in California. Okay. 
so speaking of Miami, the, the one class that I, I will admit I, I know nothing about or I don't know a single person who uh, used one is this IQ foil. And this is obviously new to everybody. What, um, where, where do you start developing that? Is it out of the ODP or is it just um, people coming in from left field? Well, um, who will say that it's going to be the biggest class in, in Miami OCR? Yeah. Uh, when we started ODP uh, five years ago, and I talked to the American One Foundation folks, you know, that they share our vision, and we always, I've been always very vocal that all our athletes should be windsurfing because it's the most organic way of sailing. And now with the foiling, being part of the, <laughs> the sport and growing, um, I think everything is an opportunity. And right now in front of me here outside the door, there's 15 IQ fall sailors and we will have 32 this weekend uh, in Miami. So it's booming and it's fun, it's technical, obviously it's fast, um, it's, we'll, we'll take it, you know? And we have girls here from Hawaii this week, from California, from all over the country, from Oregon, um, from the Northeast, Texas, Florida. Uh, obviously, a single handed class that you can fly with your equipment uh, under the uh, challenges of COVID 19 also allows for the class to grow. So, it's, it's exciting times, very exciting times. A two part question there is Is there one athlete who's, who nobody's ever heard about who's kind of standing out right now and you know, even without the formats really fixed? How do you? create a, you know, a sensible and consistent training kind of environment for these kids and spoilers? Well, that's what we're learning. Uh, we have people that they're not even on the Olympic path, but they're very good windsurfers and they have plenty of time foiling. So we can tap into their know-how and experience. Um, I just identify female sailors that are already world champions in SUP, offshore, downwind, sail it as whatever you call it, you know, and by that amazing athletes under foiling, we have Jeronimo Norris, a youth world champion, and we, we have really good coaches as well. So we're just putting the pieces together and we have a very good group um, pushing each other and learning every day. So whoever wins uh, this first uh, US Open event in Miami is, uh, has the target then, I guess, in, in terms of Leandro, can, can you speak for a moment about uh, Daniela Munoz and just what she brings to the program and what type of an athlete that she is? You are talking about Daniela Moros from Kites, Formula Kites. Yeah. Daniela is a um, very good story. Obviously, we can argue that she's the best kite, Formula Kite sailor in the world. And one thing that I'm very impressed with her is, is her attitude and personality. She's helping us uh, transition other top female sailors from other classes into Formula Kite. So she's not only now training hard to, to keep raising the bar higher for other international competitors to not be able to reach. <laughs> and by the same time, she's coaching our next generation. And it's fantastic. Overnight, we went when Daniela got involved, with ODP, we went from having one female athlete to having six female athletes foiling and kiting. Mm -hmm. So all reasons to be excited about the future. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Steve Hunt, real quick from you in San Diego. Uh, do you have your hands in, in this event in any classes? I mean, can you help identify some of your top high school kids to make sure they uh, get in on the action? Yeah, for sure. And I've been coaching a, a big 420 group in Long Beach, actually, a lot lately. We're searching for wind. Uh, Newport Beach got pretty light. And we've been doing some training in San Diego as well. And uh, for sure, I'd love to be involved. And I think it's great. It's coming out to the West Coast. And I think there'll be a lot of kids that are excited about it. And a lot of the high school kids are looking at 2028 as a perfect time to try to go to the Olympics. They'll, they'll be out of college and still have a few more years to train before that point. So I think everyone's getting excited on the West Coast. All right, man. I'm sure you got some good talent in your squad there, no doubt. For sure. All right. Um, anybody anybody want to jump in on this uh, U.S. Open series before we move on? And All right. Well, so um, 
thank you to the U.S. sailing team uh, squad there. And we'll, uh, we're all jealous of those of us in cold and northern climates that you guys are playing down there in Florida while the rest of us uh, find other ways to play. But um, uh, let's see. Anybody? Uh, Gary. The America's Cup. We're going to bring it back to you here in full circle. We All right, America's Cup. Well, uh, at the end of this week, we get to see some more racing down there. And I've spoken to uh, pretty much every, every members of every team. And everybody, of course, paints a uh, very optimistic picture that they've made a lot of progress. Uh, they have to decide what foils they're going to use uh, this week, Wednesday, two days before the racing. But keep in mind that they're a day ahead of us. And we'll see. Uh, this regatta is not terminal for anybody. Whoever wins gets a pass to the next round, and then the other two will battle out to see eventually who goes to the winner of this uh, four round robin series. So it'll be interesting. One more step. Of course, the news coming out of New Zealand with the lawsuit from Russell Coots against the graphic people seems like uh, something that was un unnecessary, but it just adds to the noise coming from down there. Wow. Well, the best noise of the day was uh, was this one here, right? That's the... Um, ah, got some cool? Uh, yeah, this is, this is always good stuff. Man. Whoa. It looks pretty breezy out there. Yes. When was this shot, Dave? So this was in the practice racing. Uh, what day is it now? Uh, yesterday, I guess it would be. Uh, Holy crap! Uh, uh, but it, you it's know, so cool that they're able to. It's so cool that they're able to write those boats. It it looks like a very rare Paige Rayleigh capsize. You know, over you go and pop it right back up. You know, nothing to it, right, Paige? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit different with the size there. As it looked, looked like a moth going down the mine, didn't it, Jonathan? Uh, but it, there, there's some other videos of it uh, with a little bore ahead that they kind of came out of the maneuver pretty um, pretty out of control, and it just took a while until they finally planted it. And, uh, but yeah, there's, there's one more thing that I wanted to point out, and this is for you, Paige, uh, that I, I did a study of uh, America's Cup winning skippers, and Ed's a part of that, uh, having had done that, and I found that the average age of uh, winning America's Cup helmsman was uh, 42. Then it made me think about, well, what was the average May age of our Americans that won Olympic medals? And I found the average age to be 36. So Paige, I don't know how old you will be uh, this summer, but I think of 34 or so. So you're gonna be right in that zone. And uh, so even though you might feel older than some of your uh, people you're mentoring, you're actually right in the zone for a medal this year. <laughs> oh, that's good news. You're saying it's my, my Olympics then. Cool. <laughs> yep. I'll point out that that probably includes statistics from back when there was keel boats and other. It uh, does. It does. I, I went back to 19. like us. <laughs> I, I went back to 1932, Jonathan. Uh, okay. I think if you look at the last Olympics, for example, and you looked at what's the average age of people getting medals these days um you'd find it's probably high 20s um maybe around 30 you know because honestly it takes those 10 years to get the experience and to get the total knowledge in order to be able to win at that level it right. seems Buddy melga's got a gold medal at the age of 42 so but that was in a keel boat and a soling yeah and how old were you when you got your bronze medal in uh, athens jonathan or, I mean, in uh, Sydney. In Sydney, I was 40. Yeah. Well, as we know, uh, as Sir Dane will tell you, that the classes these days are just a lot less forgiving on your on your bodies, right? You, this, yeah. The, the days of uh, three, four campaigns to get what you need don't happen anymore, do they, Leandro? I'm not sure about that. I think some people are very passionate about the Olympics and you know, it's, it's tailored for different personalities. Um, look at Santi Lange in, in Rio, uh, he keeps going. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as people keep pursuing excellence, 
the, the, the Olympics are always going to provide the platform. So I hope we have people, and again, building the domestic platform for this country is, is very important because we have so much talent. And, you know, one quad, two quads, three quads, even four is, mm. is, is all important, you know, it's part of the, the game. Leandro, you're right, and I, I think Paige is the perfect age and the perfect experience to have the best chance to win. And Paige, there's still time to do the America's Cup after that. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be young for that. <laughs> <laughs> Go get them. Very cool. All right. Uh, so, Ed, I did have a question back to the cup real quick. There was, um, I did have a discussion with Matt Cassidy with American Magic and uh, a bit of sort of what's going on down there and them getting ready for sailing and uh, they're, they're really hoping to, you know, be able to get as much sailing as possible, you know, but is there, so the question was, is it better to uh, sail all the way up through the finals or have to sit any of it out? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest question to answer because it completely depends on the situation of the team and the, and the capabilities and attitudes of the people on the team. You know, some people need to come in fresh and they need that, that calm time before they go racing to do their best. Other people need to be out there just fighting every day right before they get into the final match. So you can't really put that as a, a, a one size fits all answer. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how it plays out. Um, but certainly with these boats, you would think that having a, more time uh, to learn about them, just as we showed yesterday. I mean, you know, Team New Zealand, probably the slickest team out there uh, so far. And then they go and have a little snafu trying to jive in, in, a, in a racing mode. Now, maybe they broke something, maybe something didn't function correctly, or maybe they just screwed up. We don't know. Um, but you don't find that stuff out until you go racing. The challenge, of course, here is that uh, uh, the equipment is so complicated and so technical that it takes time to repair and, and correct things when it's not going right. So, you know, as we've spoken before, uh, there's never enough time in an America's Cup campaign. And uh, right. uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they use this time here in the next few weeks. Yeah, Matt seemed to, to point that they, they were really happy, obviously, with how they sailed um, the World Series. And the, the two bad tacks that kind of cost them their races were, were not uh, result of foil control system, but just technique. And so they've, they've identified, you know, where that technique uh, needs to be improved and they're, they're feeling really good. So um, I think we'll see it all go down. So um, anybody else want to chime in on the, on the cup before we wrap up? We'll be a lot smarter a week from now. <laughs> As are the Brits, right? Yeah. Hey, uh, do you, do you've got another couple of minutes, Dave? Yeah, go for it. I just wanted to talk about the Vendee Globe for a second, if, uh, if you guys will indulge me. And I don't know, uh, Peter, have you been uh, following the, the route up the Atlantic? Um, yeah, it's, got, it's gotten tricky. And it's, um, as we talked about before, that, as you said, the South Atlantic is full of, of mines and we're already seeing that and people are laning up for their passage through the doldrums. It's, it's fascinating right now. It's all on. Yeah, I've got a screenshot here. I'm not sure. Am I able to share my screen, um, yeah. Dave? Yep. Yeah. How, how do I do that? So if you scroll down to the bottom of the, uh, the image, it should be a little pop-up button there for you. The green, it, it'll highlight as green. On, um, from the Zoom? Yeah, if you go down to the bottom window where you have all the menu of options. Mute my own. I'm going to check our technical capabilities in Jonathan here. Uh, share screen. Okay. And then it'll bring you up. Okay. To there we go. Hopefully this will work. Sorry for the delay. You guys see that? All right, you're in. Okay. So this is the uh, front of the pack. Um, you can just see on the upper corner, that's the, that's Brazil. Um, the red boat has been leading for the last six weeks. Um, but you can see with all the little zigs and zags over the last day, how, how complicated it's become for him. Um, 
and now the lead's down to 12 miles numerically. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see it's not only Dolan, the yellow boat here, but there's three others lurking in the wings. So the commentators are saying basically it's a five boat race, 5,000 miles to go, you know, still with the doldrums to be negotiated. So uh, it's all on. Awesome. Are they only 12 miles apart, the yellow and the red? They're 12 boat? miles difference from the finish. They're probably uh, 100 miles apart east west. It's interesting. One's on starboard tack and the other's on port tack. And, <laughs> and it also shows that the forecasts are not 100% accurate. Like with this wind field that we're seeing, the red boat should be in more wind, but in fact, the yellow boat's in more wind. So I think that makes it extra hard that the forecasting in the South Atlantic is not that great. So they're, you know, it's, it's less sure than maybe it would be as they get further north. And maybe Peter can speak to that. Yeah, I don't know. Dave, did we, did we share that uh, routing I did after last Monday? No, uh, I can pull. Well, it's probably complicated to pull it up. So if we want to do another one, we'll 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 share. We'll add it to the broadcast, and we'll uh, we'll reshare it. Yeah, after last Monday, where as we recall, they just rounded the horn, and uh, Yannick was outside and in the breeze, and Thomas was cutting the corner in, in third place, um, and we were wondering how that was going to play out. And I I used uh, weather routing tools to analyze like nine days hence. And at that point, using weather routing, it's interesting that as you saw in that chart of Jonathan's, Yannick now, the lead boat, that orange boat that's on Port Tack is now um, the most inshore boat. So he crossed over and changed lanes. Whereas in weather routing mode, seven days ago, it said he would be at this point, it said he'd be at, he would have gained on his lead. So it'd be like 350 miles ahead and still keeping the outside lane. So, um, you know, you, whether it's the weather models don't work in the South Atlantic or just plain old weather routing as you get further out into the future gets a little bit more iffy. That's, um, we're seeing a good example of that. And that's all these guys can rely on. And I think that uh, it'll be interesting. I, I, I haven't studied the weather today and maybe I'll do that, Dave, but it does look like that, you know, it's going to be another go because there's a light air zone ahead for those boats that are in the, three boats in the outside lane. That's, that's going to make an exciting finish. <laughs> Very yonic. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'll do one final screen share here. I've had something because, you know, um, I like to give you a little taste of what's happened up in Newport. So this is the, uh, my friends down at the, the Frostplay fleet. I guess I'll have to give you a weekly update. So we've got uh, the outstanding Amanda Callahan uh, that is, I recall, was the 2020 Sunfish North American champion that she won back in November. So she's new to the fleet and she's been getting, giving the old timers uh, um, video, um, us old timers a uh, good, good run for money. So, um, all right, here we go. So uh, one thing that's unique here in Newport is this, uh, the, this fleet here likes to finish off the dock, so they don't have to have a, a race committee boat anyway. So uh, Amanda is uh, second boat here. Then in the lead here is this guy, uh, FJ Ritt, who's, who's um, a perennial fleet champion. And the final weather mark is always uh, to starboard, which allows him to reach on into the finish. So uh, this, was, this was a fun, fun, exciting moment of a northwesterly on Newport Harbor, which filters through uh, Newport Shipyard and all the rusty bucket uh, fishing boats. And so just want to note how cool Amanda is back there, just cruising along and look at the, look at the frustration of uh, FJ, just wondering, you know, what do, I, what do I do? What do I do, you know? And uh, plays a pretty smooth, smooth move here for these old tubs. Nice roll tack. Now we got starboard rounding and Amanda almost gets the hook there and not quite, you know, but I guess that just shows how awesome Little boats are sailing, you know, uh, you can do whatever you want with the butt. Anyway, see, nice day of sailing, Newport. Beautiful day. Like you lucky ones down in uh, Florida, we're still uh, we're still trying to get in. There. So anyway, that's all I've got. I had to sit that one out because uh, there's only 12 boats. I drew an X, so I get to go and run the race committee boat. So um, good times. So thank you very much, everybody. Good thank luck, you. Paige, on Friday. Your racing starts. Um, and I guess we'll follow the results there at uh, U.S. Sailing.
they'll post everything. And Dane, for you, good luck in Miami. And we'll yeah, share. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Paige and Dan, thanks a lot for sharing your experiences um, and just know that not only the people on this call, but our whole country is behind you guys. So keep it up. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. And thank you, Leandro. Go fast. Thank you, guys. Bye, Great everybody. seeing you. Cheers, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.